follow along with me here for a minute. You're about to fly somewhere on a trip. You get to the airport, you rush through the crowd, you wait through those horrendously long lines, only to be told you can't get on your flight. Not now, not ever. Airport officials neither confirm nor deny that you've been put on the no-fly list, but will tell you that you will not be allowed on a plane, entering, leaving, or flying within the United States or crossing its airspace. It's estimated that more than 21,000 people are on the FBI's top-secret no-fly list. Some, no doubt, should be there. But there's increasing frustration that thousands on the list shouldn't be. Problem is, they have no way of knowing how they got on the list or, more importantly, how to get off of it. But that may change. For the first time, a judge has ruled that the government mistakenly placed someone on the list, raising questions about the criteria used and the transparency of the process. But that decision, in favor of Malaysian professor Rahina Ibrahim, came after an eight-year legal battle and $4.1 million in court and attorney fees. She's not the only one who probably never should have been put on the list. Others include the late Senator Ted Kennedy, the singer Cat Stevens, Nelson Mandela, and even toddlers. So, does the no-fly list violate your Fifth Amendment right to due process? And will this groundbreaking case change the manner in which people are put on and removed from the list? Here to talk more about this is Ghadir Abbas, a staff attorney with CARE, that is the Council on American Islamic Relations. Joining us from Doha, Qatar is Martin Reardon. He is the former head of the FBI's Terrorist Monitoring Center. Currently, he's senior vice president of the Sufan Group, a government consulting company and Elizabeth Pipkin. She is the lead attorney for Rahina Ibrahim, who just won her no-fly case. Thanks to everyone for being here. Elizabeth, Ms. Ibrahim's case went on for more than eight years, cost more than four million bucks, and required 11,000 hours of work on the part of attorneys. Your firm handled this entirely pro bono. Why get involved in such a costly uphill battle case? Well, because it was the right thing to do. When we found out what had happened to Dr. Ibrahim, we saw that an injustice had been done, and we thought it was our obligation as attorneys and defenders of the United States Constitution to take this case on. All right, and I want to get a little more into Ms. Ibrahim's case a little later in the show, but first, let's kind of get the lay of the land here. Uh, Marty, talk to us about why the no-fly list was created and when it was created. Sure. Uh, no fly list was created in 2003 by a presidential directive. It was a result of what happened at 9-11. Prior to 9-11, there were 11 different agencies within the United States government that maintained their own version of a watch list. Most of those watch lists had no interoperability. What was on uh, one agency could not determine what was on another agency's watch list without actually calling them up and running that name. Uh, it, it, it did not work. Uh, also notable, local and state police agencies had no access whatsoever to any of those watch lists. Gadir, how does a person get on the no-fly list? You represent a lot of folks trying to get off of it. What are the criteria? Uh, well, so the criteria that we know about is that they're known or appropriately suspected terrorists, and that's what the FBI and the Terror Screening Center say are the guidelines. What we found in practice is that the List targets predominantly the American Muslim community, especially the Somali community. Uh, it also seems to be predicated upon uh, foreign travel to places like Somalia, Yemen, and other Middle Eastern uh, or South uh, Asian countries. But uh, and it also targets activists. Laura Poitras, who is the um, activist that uh, is the journalist that is working with Glenn Greenwald about the Snowden Declaration, uh, the Snowden Revelations, isn't on the no-fly list, but she's on the same terror screening database that the no-fly list is a subset of. Cool. Marty, racial profiling? Uh, no. Uh, Not it, at it all? Really make, uh, you know, with it sanctioned by the U.S. government, no. Does it happen? Yes, it happens to police agencies at every level uh, from the local right up to the federal. Is it sanctioned? No. But let me make one correction on that. Uh, it does not predominantly target American Muslims. And, I, and I'll say this, the no-fly list the rough numbers, the public source numbers, it's roughly 20,000 people on there. Less than 5% are Americans or, or resident, uh, resident aliens in the United States. 
Less than five percent. Well, we have some community tweeting in just about that, but right now we have a former flight attendant, Rita, who on Facebook says, as a former flight attendant, this program does work most of the time after 9-11. SWAT took off a terrorist from my plane. But, Vadir, going to your point, we have an Iranian-American Muslim filmmaker, Justin, who tweeted in, I was intimidated and encouraged to not seek counsel during over four hours of questioning at the airport. Idman just tweeted in, I think Muslims are targeted or anyone who resembles them, the quote-unquote other. Rueda says, because of the phobia caused by the damage inflicted on 9-11 still lives on. This is trickling racist hysteria. And then Big Neck says, everyone that scares the TSA eventually ends up on this list. And Elizabeth, going to you with this, who actually is on this list? Nobody knows. The government has claimed secrecy over all of the information about who is on this list or why they are on this list. It is a secret blacklist, and it is almost impossible to find out why you're on there or whether how you can be taken off. Well, at least one person outside of government circles has actually seen the no-fly list. Joe Trento is a journalist. Take a listen to what he has to say. Uh, the list I had was from 2005, 2006, and uh, it was obtained through an industry source which showed you that the uh, security around the no-fly list is, is basically a joke. The list we got in 2005, 6 had heads of state on it. I mean, it was absurd. And there were people routinely who were allowed to travel to the United States who were on the no-fly list. But the reality is that the, the, the list is really something to comfort the public, to make us feel better. But it's, it's a really a kind of meaningless list. Marty, Marty, is this an ineffective, meaningless list? No, not at all. Uh, it works. It, it's a large list. It, how, and, how do you know that it works? I've personally involved in it for a pretty significant uh, amount of my career with the FBI and directly involved, uh, you know, for a portion of time at the end of my career at the terrorist screening center. But the comment about heads of states or even senior officials from states, yes, there have been heads of states on the list, senior government officials from other states on the list. Uh, but these were states that sponsor and support terrorism. That's why they are on there. Well, Marty, speaking about effectiveness, our community tuned in about that. How would anyone know if this is effective? They say it's so secret, we only find out about it when some soldier is denied boarding. And then Sam Renegade says the TSA only performs security theater, and they specialize in profiling. They have let terrorists go. We need a full rethink of what's happening. Ghadir, I'm going to go to you with this. Look, speaking about letting terrorists go, we know that Omar Farouk abdul Muttalib, you know, the Nigerian underwear war bomber, wasn't on the list. Yeah. Faisal Shahzad, the Pakistani-American, failed Times Square, but wasn't on the list. So speaking about effectiveness, a lot of us are wondering, those two would be uh, terrorists. How did they not get on this list? It's uh, not a product of the watch listing proce process not being robust enough or failing in this individual in instance. It's a fact that the watch listing process itself is a, a fool's errand. We, if someone is uh, sus uh, suspected of a crime, law enforcement should investigate that person. And if the law enforcement finds evidence, actual evidence, they should be charged with the crime. But our safety is not served and our rights are imperiled if the FBI is given extrajudicial authority to punish people for life by preventing them from flying.